So maybe in the meantime, uh, we can discuss briefly what we have covered already in this first hour and what is still to be covered, at least from our uh, today's perspective. So I think we've covered um, a lot about, let's see. Uh, about operational safety, right? Yes. Uh, how to operate tractors, how to work with chemicals, noise, um, protection, protective clothes, uh, washing, taking showers, uh, milk. Uh, I find this interesting because milk is, it's a superstition in all cultures you find that Milk is 98% water. So why not drink water? This has the same effect. Um, then mental health. So it's good to laugh, as you see. <laughs> and um, uh, but we all need to live. We need to live the culture of HSE. So it is something life. It is not something that is not a table or a set of procedures. No, it is something that we have to reinvigorate every day and in every moment in all interactions that we are carrying out right so is that uh, does someone want to add other major topics that we have been discussing today while i'm trying to upload this file here so that we can finally start uh, Uh, when it comes to storing uh, be it uh, chemicals and seed, there are some places where they don't even differentiate between the two. You find a pile of seed seated next to a pile of fertilizer or even on the same pallet, which is uh, a bit risky as well. One, for the seed on this one, sitting next to fertilizer is being dehydrated and chances are high it will not germinate when it gets to the field and now you wish hunting what caused this poor germination it is just pure administrative or organizational issue in your storeroom and then there's also the case where even the steak that is put for that fertilizer probably it's above everyone's head that if any bag just slides when someone is underneath the person is good as dead. So these are some of the things that also should be put in place. But yes, they've decided this is a storeroom. But that consciousness to just say the pile is now too, too long or too high for anyone. No one takes care of that. So these are things that happen. And Alec and Tim should also take into account and look into them. I think there are a number of issues. Vinicius, you may also help. There are things that we have seen. That sometimes you think it's common sense, but common sense does, doesn't apply everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think the, the most things that we can do it without any extra budget is organized. You know? Like your organization is free, just go some time and make your job more efficient and more safe. So like as Lenny told, chemicals with seeds is like, you cannot put together for thousands of reasons, right? And your seed is what you're looking for. And you're put the seeds in a place that you decrease your germination rate. So this is really bad. Uh, another thing that we should think about is like uh, to, to centralize the things this is make easy. Maybe you can centralize uh, the procedures to just one person or two people. And this is make it easy for you to, to keep going with the, the, the correct place for each storage. Um, but cleaning and organizing is the thing that maybe you should focus now. Are you ready, Bodo? No. <laughs> it's, it's downloaded. 
Yeah, well, it has a huge represent representation. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I was not aware of this. I must apologize. <laughs> I thought I had everything under control, but this is as it happens. Yeah, and also, the, just like what uh, Vinicius was talking about, the issue of just pure organization. Organizing the place such that you know it's not a risk to anyone. There was one place where we got to, and we were told the guy who is responsible, or the clerk who is responsible, is somewhere in that store. And you know, the guy is hiding behind uh, a pile of fertilizer, a pile of seed, and they are even wondering if anything is to happen, how does he jump from there just to save his life? So sometimes it's just organization doesn't need any, just organizing the place doesn't need any extra budget. And it's, you're also saving not only your life, but also your colleague within that work institute. And then uh, also going to the issue of uh, where you keep your tools. This is a common practice in national programs. I don't know if it's also a common practice here or God will help us. You know, the, there's a car which has been involved in an accident. It's more or less a write-off. It's waiting for, uh, for disposal. But that car is given preference over equipment that is working. You find it well packed in the shed, even covered with a plastic. But the combined harvester, which is working and fully functional, which needs uh, to be protected against the weather variants, is seated outside there, and you are protecting a, a rake, which is no longer working. And then even when it comes to uh, tools, the holes, the rakes, and so forth, they're just sprawling all over. Someone can step onto a rake or a fork, it's an injury. No one cares about that. It's only looked for when someone wants to use it. So these are some of, some of the things that, you know, we are saying they don't need any budget. It's a matter of just sitting down as a team, Alec, and also even just people who have fully functional facilities that they, just, they can just come and do a presentation or ever even assist just to make sure that at least we know where to start from and where to go. But these are basic. Some of the things that all of us, we already know, but it's a matter of the mental will to go towards that route. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for bridging this gap. <laughs> I think we are now back to operational, right, Amir? Yes. So this is the second discussion on the topic of HSE. And it has been entitled by the organizers with health, safety, security, and environment. Where are we today? So the next, please. So we have uh, already discussed what we have covered in the first hour in the first session and now um the things that that we have not yet covered uh, at least from my perspective what came up to me during this first hour is that we have been missing these two items uh one is temperature i mean the outside the environmental temperature uh, and the other one the other one is the environment by itself so uh temperature uh, you people have been born here, uh, you have been living here, you have spent most of your life here. And for you, it is normal that uh, during daytime, uh, you have sunshine and it is warm and it is nicely warm. And sometimes it is uh, more than warm, it is really hot. Now, I tell you from an experience in southern France in Europe, when I was there for the first year as a breeder, in April, May, people would be approaching me for my team, people from the government, from the authorities, and also from the enterprise, telling me summer is coming, summer is approaching, the temperatures will rise. Sometimes there will be temperatures up to 35 degrees. So 35 is considered extremely hot in France. Yeah? And I was instructed what I had to instruct my people about. 
that was drink sufficient water. We had to supply drinking water to the employees. Drink sufficient water. Don't forget drinking water. Wear light clothes. Shelter. Seek shelter. So uh, avoid bri uh, bright sunshine for a long time. Take a rest every hour, every certain period. Uh, watch each other. If someone is feeling weak or some problems are arising, call for help. Now, this is something that I have not seen here during the year that I have been spending here in the west of Africa in, a, in an area that is significantly hotter than the south of France. So maybe this is something to consider and maybe someone uh, has already some experience or some received some training about this and wants to add in here. So if this is not uh, going on now, this is okay. I just wanted to put this here. And the other one, the other item is the environment. We have been talking so far about the operations of our day-to-day -day work and the health risks which arise from these operations, right? But we have not uh, sufficiently covered, in my eyes, uh, the protection of the environment. And this leads me to the definition of HSE. And I took that from Wikipedia. You will see it a little later. Um, so Wikipedia, the English Wikipedia says, um, environment, health, and safety. So they do not say health, safety, and environment. They say environment, health, safety. EHS, okay, is an acronym for the set that studies and implements the practical aspects of protecting the environment and maintaining health and safety at occupation. In simple terms, and now this is to memorize, it is what organizations must do to make sure that their activities do not, ca do not cause harm to anyone and anything. So this is the definition of HSE or EHS. Yeah? Uh, avoid doing harm to anything and anyone. This is the important thing. And um, that is why nowadays we, we live in 20, above 2020 and we have huge problems to stem. I mean, maybe it will not affect me so much when you look at, so Alec mentioned already my uh, specificities with a sense. So probably for me, uh, my expected lifespan will not go into very far into the future compared to most of you. Uh, so I, well, I could be mean and say congratulations to all the problems that the older generations have dumped onto you. So we have uh, this excess amount of CO2 that is pumped into the atmosphere by human activities, which causes climate change with, with, with global warming. We have the extreme over pollution of our ship. You know, we have our, this is our ship. We are sitting here. We happen to be here. There is no rescue there's nothing that could uh, save us if we destroy our ship the, the question here bodo is that you, you, are you insinuating one way or the other that the challenge is the older generation uh, yes yes you, you yes you understood that right uh, i think it is even because it's going on now I don't think many of us appreciate here, so especially from the older generation here, you know, so it's, a, it's the thing, maybe uh, the, the approach, it's not per se the, the older generation, because some, some things maybe that were more environmentally sustainable, you think, in the old days? Um, do not 
just look at it from this flat view of your and my existence here. Uh, look at it from the generational view of the governments and of the uh, 70s and the 50s and the former times where the, uh, some of these problems uh, had begun to be created. And uh, for example, the governments uh, have always been opening the door for industries to develop because of some reasons. And even until now, many laws, many legislations are built according to the needs of the industry and according to the needs of the growing population in the sense that um, environmental issues are still neglected, but uh, this time is past. We must understand the time past. There is no possibility anymore to neglect the environment. Uh, if we continue at the pace we have been continuing, we run into havoc. We run into big disaster, which will hit uh, the younger among us. This is what I wanted to say. Yeah. And now what we can do is to finally do everything to protect the environment. And to, in the sense of HSE or EHS, not uh, avoid doing any harm to environment. Okay, and when I say environment, uh, maybe you can quickly go up again to the second slide. Just click, click the upper direction. No, we have, uh, one more. Yeah, this one. Yeah, this one. So environment, the components are air, wildlife, soil, and water. Okay, so the air is where all these gases, go into. So when we use chemicals, the, uh, the vaporizing things go into the air. When we make fire, uh, the ashes go into the air, the CO2 goes into the air. Wildlife, uh, unfortunately, uh, I know that this is probably something that you will uh, have a different opinion. Snakes belong to wildlife. So it's something that somehow we have to do something to uh, not not extremely damage the snake wildlife in this sense, among many other things. Of course, this is just one extreme, but there are so many. I've, I hope you understand me. So uh, soil, we know that we have been running into big problems doing the, even here at IITA, at the CGIR centers, uh, experimental sites. The soils are getting depleted. This is known. The problem has been known. The problem has been investigated to some extent. And we do not enough to stop this or to turn it around. This is another issue which belongs in my eyes to um, EHS. <laughs> and the other one is the water. We know that we, we are now uh, projecting new irrigation facilities because we have problems with the water and we need the water. And on the other hand, the water that we have, we do not really care for it. And uh, I will get to that a little later. Maybe you can uh, advance quick. Yeah, now this one, this, is, this comes from a hobby of mine, which is game theory. So why do, why do I mention game theory? Um, game theory is a set of methods to, to understand uh, how people act and react in a game or, or when they communicate with each other or in war, for example. And uh, now, how does this relate to this image? This is the famous Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico that um, crashed in 2020. So uh, this is, uh, so this Arecibo telescope, those of you who have been uh, an interest in astronomy and uh, basic physics know that during the past 50 years, Arecibo, with its 300 meter 
diameter mirror has been the number one instrument where mankind confirmed and received new uh, new insight into the, uh, into the cosmos, into the world, how it works. And it is a precious thing and it has crashed, unfortunately. So what was going on there? And for that, we have a, a YouTube video and uh, Amir, um, I would like to ask you to go to the link that is on the next slide and start that. If you can, it is not a link, uh, please. You have to copy it into the browser and start it from there. So what do you think about these items? The environment, the soil, the farm soil, the, the water. What do you think? Does this bring some associations to your mind? The microphone, please. <laughs> Thank you. For, for the environment, a lot. There are a lot of things to think about. I will just pick uh, soil and water. Okay. You know, for soil, I'm talking from the perspective from Ghana. You know, you continuously do planting, replanting, planting, replanting, and what happens is that the nutrients get degraded. You don't have any choice than to use chemical fertilizers because that is more cheaper than using organic. So you add chemical fertilizers and we all know the effect of chemical fertilizers on the soil. So you end up uh, destroying the natural environment in the soil, thereby degrading the soil, which is something that we should think about. Then water, okay. Water, we, we do a lot of uh, small scale mining in Ghana. And then this effect of small scale mining, especially using the uh, um, um, chemicals to wash the gold and stuff like that, it drains into the water. And it's this same water that we use to water our crops. Yeah. So the effect is, 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 is uh, in a way, is, is dangerous. Um, you know, the, the chemicals that they use in washing these uh, minerals is also dangerous to, mm -hmm. to, to humans. And that if it enters into the system of the plant, you have as a plant and you eat. So there are a lot of things to talk about. I'll, yeah. I'll give the opportunity for others to also come. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. What are you trying to do about? So you have a lot of contamination. Yes. Yes. And and so uh you know, you know, it's, it's all about stakeholder engagement. It doesn't come from the it doesn't it doesn't come from only one side. Okay. We, we we as institutions, we are we are also responsible. In a way we are responsible. The government to the 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 government in a way is also responsible because we need to stop this illegal mining which is causing a, a damage to the water bodies and we are using to, to, to irrigate. So it's, it's a lot of uh, stakeholder engagement coming from our side and then from, from policy uh, makers also. Men all over the world have made changes to the world are crazy men. The problem we are having in the world now is depletion of the ozone layer by the use of uh, uh, some chemicals that we use for preservation and for cooling. It is believed that the earth is eating up faster than it used to be. Now, how do we get the temperature of the earth down? I'm looking at the global perspective, not our individual countries, not our micro situations in every country on the farms and co. There are deserts in the world. I just Googled up a figure. They said 
the underground water we have in the world is about 2.78 million trillion gallons. We have not tapped into that. I read up an article that said that uh, the cyclone that affects America sometimes develop from the Sahara Desert. We have the Kalahari in Africa, in South Africa. If the world is really interested in bringing down the temperature of the world as the water of the seas are rising, why are we not pumping water from the sea to the deserts and convert them to places that can grow and increase our, uh, and reduce our carbon emissions as sink that can absorb those carbon that we are generating. Look at Mali, look at um, all the countries north of West Africa, desert countries. Yeah. Why can't we pump water from the sea and reduce the amount of water in the sea? The salinity, just keep pumping. Just pump that water. Now, if you look at if you look at uh, Chad, for example, Lake Chad Basin is drying up as a result of human activities. Francis, there are very many solutions being developed at this time. Really, when you when you uh, keep an eye on it, you you can see that there are so many universities in the world that are turning toward that topic that are working with steam, with full steam on finding solutions. So this is, you know, we are at the verge of these things to come. And, uh, and I think it is very nice that you mentioned this. Uh, we have little time, so maybe we can um, continue this discussion. Uh, it's just later. It's just important to, uh, to see that what you say is right. Uh, we need to activate every little resource we have to counteract these big effects. And uh, we have, but we have to do it in an intelligent way. Nothing that will really, it is, I'm not talking about somehow uh, reducing our work here yeah, or reducing the need to, to try uh, agricultural plants to select those that we need to, to feed the people. I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about intelligent solutions that help maintaining the environment in a, in a, good, in a good shape. It, because this is to the, to the benefit of us, of ourselves. We have to do it. And uh, as these universities are working on finding solutions, we also have to work steadily on finding our solutions for it. If I just, may interject here just uh, briefly, uh, yeah, I, I totally understand that, you know, this is a world, world thing that we need to address. However, for, for, this, for our sake, at least, let us start from our small scale. Okay, because if we think about the large scale, I don't think we have a budget to buy new equipment, you know, trying to, to, to get things done. So let us start, you know, bit by bit, take small steps, at least so we can move, move forward yeah. with things, right? So uh, yeah. let, us, let us start with our small scale and then we can, we can grow on that yeah. uh, globally. Yeah, yeah so and, and, uh, if, if I have a few minutes more, uh, I will also come to a thing that is known, a phenomenon that is known as moral hazard. Moral hazard is something important uh, in our behavior that uh, relates somehow to that, but also to many other things. And for that, um, perhaps we can now show a few seconds of this video. Stop. So what have you seen? Can you describe, is there someone who wants to describe it or just give it an, adject, an attribute, something with it? Nice, uh, impressive. 
What do you think? Underneath. Okay. So the story behind that is um, this is the radio telescope at Arecibo, Puerto Rico, that served humankind for 50 years to make the biggest discoveries, right? And on one sunny day in May or June 2020, it fell apart, as you could see in this video. This has been captured by video because experts, engineers had been expecting this event to take place at some moment, but they, nobody could predict when it would happen. The, the story about this telescope is that the part that just fell from the sky is the um, receiver. It is it was hanging above a mirror. The mirror is built into this doline like uh, mountain mount. Uh, it, it measures 300 meters in width. And this uh, receiver that was hanging there, the lens, in fact, uh, weighed in the beginning 600 tons. So it was erected in, in the 1970s and 600 tons were hanging on ropes, on, 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 on uh, steel wires for uh, 50 years. And in uh, 2017 or 16, um, they added another device to the 600 tons, another 300 tons. So we had 900 tons hanging there in the sky above the, tel uh, above the ground. And uh, then they realized that even this, these steel wires got tired over the many years, over the many decades of uh, strenuing. Uh, they got tired. And because these ropes are made of very many hundred wires, uh, once it breaks, it will not break at once. It will break step by step mostly invisibly and silently, this will go on. First, one of these wires, the, the rope is composed of, will just uh, break at some point, somewhere, where the uh, st uh, strength is too strong to, to withstand it. And then uh, the, the remaining load is thrown onto the remaining wires within that rope. And then another wire will cut somewhere else. And then the third one and the fourth one and so on. And this stretches out over decades. This takes, in this case, it took um, 20 years uh, since they discovered first that a few of these wires were just um, enlarging and then uh, overstretching and then breaking. And perhaps, Amir, you could go forward to near the end of this video. So yes, there, for example, yes. And let's see uh, if we, um, a little bit, yeah. So now you, you could play it again. So what we see here, so that's the same image that we saw. So, and you saw the arrows. The arrows showed that there was uh, also a, a cable that was connecting the tower. Stop, please. And go back a little bit further, a little bit further back, back, further, further back, further back. Yes, um, yes further back, further back, 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 back. Yes, back. A little back. Stop, yeah, before, uh, after this gentleman, after, yes, somewhere there, yes. Now let, let it run, please. No, this is not, uh, so let's see if, if the point comes. It should come. So here, what you see here is the 
uh, is one of these bases where these cables are connected to. And you see they are painted with white paint. And at some spots, this paint has gone off. And this is where the wires underneath were stretching and they destroyed the paint. So therefore this can be seen. And this was just close to the moment where this crash occurred. Um, a fifth, there are four cables and no, there are three cables in the line and the fourth cable is already gone. That was gone before. Um, now, uh, when you let this go a little bit, you run, let it run a little bit. You can see when you watch it, you can see how here cable after cable is uh, taking more load, stretching more and breaking. So, and this is something that has a lot to do with uh, our topic, health, safety, and environment protection, because, you know, this cable is now breaking entirely, and now the next one, and now the last one that was, that seemed to be in best shape, very quickly decomposes too. Yeah. So, and this is uh, the phenomenon that we see as humans is that this is an extremely rare event. You know, this big accident with, with the telescope will crash is extremely rare. Yeah. So, um, and we think it occurs once in a while, but nobody can say, can say when. Uh, nobody can uh, predict when. And uh, so we are helplessly exposed to that. But the only experience we have is that it is extremely rare that this can happen. So that is why um, when, I when I was an expert, for example, I'm, uh, when I'm an expert in cables, uh, it could be that I operate a cable car in the mountains for the skiers or, or somewhere else. And this cable car, this also happened in uh, 2021 in Austria. They had a cable car accident where um, the pull, so the, there are these carriages and they are uh, sitting on a, on a supporting rope. And then there is a pulling rope. And uh, in uh, April 2021, at one of these cable cars, um, the pulling rope broke off and the carriage that was connected to it, what was next connected to it, started running backward, downhill, hit another carriage. And when they ran together, they hit the first and uh, next one and so on. And there were people killed, some were uh, um, um, injured and it was a big disaster. And it turned out that this was due to human error. And the error was that the humans, those who operated, the professionals, had uh, voluntarily and knowingly removed the security brakes. Why? Uh, so with a security brake is a sort of clamp that um, breaks that, uh, every single car. So that once this pulling rope breaks or, or uh, just disappears, these carriages do not move anymore. They, they get arrested where they cannot move. Now, um, these operators had been observing on that same cable car for some time already before this accident happened, that the, uh, the brake this security brake, this safety brake, would operate unexpectedly for unknown reason. Yeah, and so they thought, okay, this this brake is broken. We have to do something about the brake. And so they started investigating into that. They couldn't find it out. And so they said, okay, let's take this brake off. Let's take it out of operation. 
And then uh, while we are working on this, because big thing that this big uh, pudding rope will break, this is a very, very rare uh, event. This will not happen, of course. So we, we can say we are safe. Yeah? But what happened was the same thing what you saw here, that these cables are built of very many wires. And every time once one of these wires broke, somewhere because it was wared out to some extent. Uh, this caused a change of the power of the strength within this whole cable. And that caused these breaks to respond. Definitely. And, Bodo, yeah? Sorry. Yeah. It, and it this is, is so uh, what these people did was uh, the, the phenomenon that is known as moral hazard. So they willingly removed the security Right. That was built in there. The issue okay. here, very small this mistakes. This is what I wanted to bring. Yeah, small mistakes can lead to larger ones eventually, yes. okay, lead to and disasters. You have, you have, once you see uh, these events are rare, small events are more frequent. And when you see small, the same kind of small events appearing one after one in a relatively short time, uh, do not try to work on that small event try to find the reason for it because this is the important uh, uh, thing to to really care about yeah we, we need to just get back to our safety here in in with respect to operations and we understand that there are many gaps there okay we've seen a lot of uh, either, uh, let's say, performances or even equipment that are being operated that are not safe. Okay, we need to understand from your perspective what the gaps are, okay, and how we can overcome these. What can we do to change this current situation? Okay, everybody is working and we need to work together in a very safe environment. Okay, there are so many parameters that can cause hazards. All right, so in your opinion, and from your perspectives, okay, what are the gaps? What are the challenges? And what can we do to overcome them? I'll pass the mic to everyone, okay? And I'll mm -hmm. be taking notes at the same time, all right? Okay, for the safety and the security at the NAS level concerning my institute, I could really, I when I was answering the survey, I realized that the max was very low because I have to be frank. The safety of our implements and chemicals is currently not in good shape. Most of our equipment, a lot of them have been improvised because like you receive an implement, it doesn't come with spare parts. So when there is a breakdown, the operators or the farm management have to improvise to make the machine work. And in doing so, they are exposed to a lot of Hazard. I think last time I met came, you have a lot of tractors. They are working, but their PTO is not covered, which exposes the operators and other people to a lot of danger. So when implements are coming, at least they should come with supporting paper so that when they break down or they need to be repaired, they can be changed and fix it into original state as they came, as to supposed to improvising as a result of the absence of the original part to fix. And also the, in terms of storage, as Lenin mentioned, we store fertilizer and seeds, everything together. We should try to separate and get shelves. Most of the time the structures are there, but it's the arrangements and uh, what should I say, proper maintenance or somebody to ensure that they work. Because in my institute, 
the storage area is not a problem. Maybe the shelves are there, but the personnel to ensure that those equipment are put at the right places is where the, the problem is. So currently there's a, a huge gap when you come to the NAS and we should ensure that the standard practices are put in place. Thank you. Yes, for the environment, it's a bit better, but we can improve it because at my end, I remember last year, we were forced to change all our fire extinguishers because the fire extinguishers have been there for since the, the, the building of the institute. The old ones, we open all the chemicals have dried out. So we were faced, we were forced to replace all those ones. And also, as mentioned here, we used to store chemicals, leftover chemicals. Some chemicals will be 10 years and 20 years over, but they are still kept in the stores. So we are also forced to dispose them. And I was laughing when a colleague mentioned that uh, we need to pay a price or money for your chemical to be disposed. And when our institute were asked to dispose our old stuff, and according to procedure, it has to be done by another organization, which is the Environmental Protection Agency. And the bill they brought to the institute to be able to dispose <laughs> the chemicals was, was something laughable. We say, as something that we can just go and dug a, a, a hole and put them in, you bring us this bill to, to dispose them. And it became a big issue. So I think uh, we need to also enforce those ones. And most of the chemicals, you come, the chemicals have been as part. And last time I was having this issue with my technician, they said, they brought the chemical. If you look at the expiring day, the thing has expired. But they say, hey, boss, the expired chemicals even work better than, <laughs> better than the original ones. So I said, how come? So we need to enforce all this. If the thing is expired, I mean, it's expired. Thank you. So on the the gap um as for me i think uh experience they said is the best teacher i believe that the environment that we operate around here in it is uh different from what we can find i mean outside here so um some of our people that have worked here actually pick up a lot of new knowledge and get to know a lot of things and uh, if you know better, you do better. So when we get here, we know better and we do better. So as much as possible, those people should be retained. We have that challenge here, especially those people that work more on the field. They are usually short term staff and they work one month, two months, they are gone. So the issue of HSE are interconnected. So many things are involved. But here when we are trained, you have this knowledge, you do better. Even though you will let them go, it should be that they are going for something better than what they currently have here. And they can create impact elsewhere and you know, have a kind of multiplier effects of whatever knowledge they gain here. So as for me, I think we should try as much as possible to retain people that are trained here so that, uh, you know, they can do something better even when they live here to get to higher position. Well, I will start by saying that um, the safety committee already put in place should be worked on or looked into so that some of the rules already on ground can be revisited because some of them are just there on the paper. There's no implementation on them. And uh, the other side of it is that the specialist to, as regards to equipment, there's one basic thing that we are missing. We keep importing machines, implements, without training of the people who are going to use these implements. No matter how good an implement is, when you have a bad operator, I'm afraid the implement is bad as well. 
So one of the key things we are facing in IIT for today, but apart from the training aspect of it, they are not recognized. They don't think, the management don't think they are, they are doing anything important. The decision making and bad from the top, just throw it on to them, let them go and get it done. And because of that kind of attitude, the people doing the job are not encouraged. I want to say that um, since Ms. Ali came, they have been accusing some of us. <laughs> yes, I'm one of them. <laughs> I've been accusing some of us not wearing our safety boots. Safety boots, like uh, my colleague said, when we're out there, is not the only thing. The uniforms, do you know that there are times you ask for, I want to buy a rain boot. Now, I think I went with Mr. Lee to the store to get a tape, electric, electric tape. He asked me, I said, we don't have. So what? I said, yes. So okay, can we get some? I said, yes, we can, but we need to pass through Oracle. But that Oracle will take you one week to get these two tapes. But we went there together with him. He signed the papers. He got it out because he is the budget officer. And there are some other cases where you have similar problems. The budget officer will tell you, I'm afraid there's no money in the budget. What do you do? Improvise. And that in the case of improvising, you start using things that you are not supposed to use. And when you start using things that you are not supposed to use, all of us know what the result will be. So for the environment in IIT, like my sisters have just said, some of us have been privileged to work here for some time, and we've learned a lot of things. I think, like I said before, there are some rules, good rules that are on ground that are never attended to. We should be to start working on them. Then um, for the general environment, there have been a lot of laws, like no killing, no shooting, no burning, not this, this and that. I've been trying, we have been trying to see that we keep to those laws. And there was a time we were asking questions, why all these kind of laws? But it made us understand some of the reasons why that we need to keep to those things. And because we can also see practically that they are benefit to some, to all of us, we are using them. So thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, uh, let me just talk on uh, the temperature, which uh, Mr. Evers talked about. Uh, he mentioned that uh, during the working time, there's need to um, have some break. Maybe you observe the workers when they work for one hour, you check them whether they are in order or not. Yes, you see, there, are, there is a way to avoid that. Um, before I even went to university, I remember there are times we go to the farm in the night. We use a, uh, this, I call it bush candle, which is made from a uh, palm, uh, palm, uh, palm oil. So you pull them at the, that's it, this is the place you want to heap. You pull there because, or maybe snake or the rest, you pull them at the four corners. And you start to, to, to make your hips, I bet you, you will do more than somebody. The work you're supposed to do for one hour, you can do it all that 20 minutes and you will not be sweaty and your head is preserved. So I think the Institute borrows something or such. That is why they said in IITA, we should be resuming 730 and close by 12 o'clock. Because from the weather, we know that the temperatures are always higher around two, uh, 2 in the afternoon. So anything from 12, 1, 2, maybe to 3, we find that the temperatures are always very high. So we should avoid as much as possible to work during, uh, uh, from anything from 12 to maybe 4. So if you do that, that idea of a high temperature or whatever, you will avoid it. And you also borrow from the local people. You see, when they are plating yam, 
they don't any tea from 10 o'clock. They will stop party. What they do by then, between 10 and 12, they start the, the mochi. So because the, the sense is there. If you open the hip and the oil is hot after 10 o'clock, then it's like you are boiling your yam. So we should always try as much as possible to work in the morning. But you find that in ITA, even after 12, you see this on casual, still working on the feet. They are not follow the, the leader. The, the law is there, what Mr. Albert said, but we don't follow it. We need to follow what they told us to be following. And that enforcement should be in place. The laws are actually there. The SOPs are there, but do we follow them? We don't. You give somebody a, a, a safety boot, he will tell you no. He's not, he's pinning him on the leg. These are, tomorrow, you see the person wearing them to a party. Where those safety who is supposed to wear to walk as service leg, but he will not use them. He will wear them to Owabe. So, so, <laughs> so thank you very much. Let me know what it's Thank done. you. Thank you so much. It, it's been known, you know, in, in some hot areas, I've been, I've been working in near desert and er, desert areas for like Iraq, for example, they tend to go very early to the fields. Okay. That means they, they are at the field. They move from wherever they, they are. They, they reach the field by 5 30 AM in the morning. But I don't think that this is a policy that uh, we might in, endure because no at peak hours, you know, in certain areas, they, it reaches up to 50 degrees Celsius by 50 degrees Celsius. You're basically depleting your body of water okay and you're getting heat strokes okay so if you're not hydrating okay if you you're not uh, uh protecting your skin okay you're liable to get uh, meningitis or uh, some sort of other disease you know or or having heat strokes in in the field so they tend to work from early in the morning 5 36 all the way to 11 30 between 12 and two o'clock or, or 12 and three o'clock, they stop and then they work from four to six. But then we also have, you know, the near nighttime and there's also traffic to go back home, etc. all of that. It's not as simple as we like it to be. For farmers, it is different because they're working their own lands. But for us as a research station, I don't know how it can be managed. Maybe we can uh, manage the, the work plan to do things early in the morning, for example, or in the afternoon in the field. And if there are things that we need to do in the workshop or like more of uh, uh, logistical stuff then, or anything that we can do, be it repairs or et cetera, we can do that or schedule that in between uh, at during uh, peak hot hours. It's just a recommendation. Um, for me, I, I look at um, number one thing that give me concern so much is about storage facilities. If you don't store, most of the time we don't store the in the right facility. For example, there's supposed to be um, cabinet for storing of chemicals, flammable chemicals, but most of the time we find them on just an open shelf. Remember, we had a little fire accident 2019 in our place there, or just in the afternoon. I think it's an old electrical wire just packed. I was right there. And the next store is where you have our, our um, series of stores. One of them is for material, that one is for chemicals. Something was already going into the roof, but thank God we had the functional um, fire extinguishers. That's what brought it by that control. I mean, where that very store where that something has entered, there was an internal kept there. Which has just been a disaster. So, and they're not in a cabinet anyway. So, we should keep uh, flammable ca um, chemicals in cabinets uh, away from where they can. Leave. But we don't do that. Most, both chemicals and fertilizers. The other thing is proper disposers of empty cans and used or expired um, chemicals. Now, I, I made mention of it today when I was talking about the fact that we have a safe. A disposal committee that's it looks like it's moribund, but sometimes you ask them to come, you don't get them coming, and then uh, you have to take your things to them 
when they ask you to bring it. And if the man who scheduled the time is not there, you can't even dispose of them. So it's under challenge. I think we need to enforce this. I also noticed that there are hours of application of chemicals. In those days, it would be re really enforced when we had uh, Dr. Jakai in, as, as a person in charge. But he's left right now for close to 20 years. Since then, things have changed, and it looks like everybody does what he or she likes. And um, we need to revisit those situations so that um, you set a, tag, a timeline for chemical application, whether it is herbicide or insecticide or whatever it is. I would say between this time and this time, you can apply. Any time from here to that time, don't apply. But on the field, you found something different. And then you also discover sometime, was it 2020, when uh, my line manager had to take photographs of, uh, use the empty cans right on the field. They were so much that you were just hooked up. And uh, you were used by this, by a particular unit, they were left on the field. But it was just assigned to our own field. Then he saw, he took photographs, sent to me and said, who did this? Then uh, I think it was sent to, We'll see, and then I think Ali also got a photograph of it. We had to find out who did it. We found the people, but then it was just like, so I think you put a penalty. These, these are things that are they, are, they are, they are policies that are existing, but it's like they've been neglected. Like what I told Alec today, let me see say it, is um, coming on your table. I think sometimes you need to, as it's going now, you need to enforce some things and say, this is what's supposed to put your feet down, say what we want to happen. By the time you put a fine, people will change because of the problem that no fine, uh, so they can't do anything. We should use the correct um, equipment to do all the right people do the correct the job we are doing. Most of the time, it prov you improvise, improvise, improvise. Um, safety, um, field uniform. I know of a particular scientist for more than five years, he now provided only one. Any, any safety um, coverall and their boots for his people. At a point, I had to go to the HR, Human Resources Variety, to ask a question. I said, every um, feed coat pass through your table because you have to say to them, they approve it before the request for a person to go to make them. This thing has been coming on. How do you check me scientists who don't provide for their people? They were looking at me. Yeah, you, that's supposed to be your job. Today, I was telling my colleague here, that it looks like the HR unit of IATA is not for national staff. Yeah, no, not for national staff because you don't care about what happened to us. It's just a case of scientists said this, so you have to do it, whether it is right or wrong. And they will, they will advise you, don't say anything to you because it can suck you. But that's not what they are meant for. To me, I think they should, that one needs to be addressed. It's not supposed to be like that. Then I, I want to say as I conclude, that the management, management in this case, not just talking about IT management as the management, the management of each unit should ensure that things are enforced. In my unit, for example, my blind manager made to understand that it's my duty to ensure that everybody going to the field put on the personal protective equipment. If they don't do that, I'll be held responsible. So, because I don't want anybody to come and tell you to something, I have to make sure that I enforce it. If you are not, if you are going to the field, you are not wearing a field uniform. You are not going to the field, which means, and I say it as I say it here, it means you are not ready for work for that day. You are not supposed to come to work. Otherwise, you go back and change, or you go home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for the sake of time, I'm sorry if some do not share right now, but please send me your notes because the the discussions, okay, and the items that we're receiving are really. Uh, important for us. There are many gaps that you are pinpointing, like the system of accountability is one, one of the things that you just mentioned, and this is quite important. I just want, before I close this uh, health and safety discussion, is if you look at this, we, we had Maslow's hierarchy of needs there for a very good reason. Okay? One of the basic needs that you can see there is safety needs. Okay. Maslow's needs is basically for every individual. So if you are within any organization, if you should, if you're not feeling safe, 
you will not be able to produce. You will not be able to be productive. You will not be able to be efficient. Neither will you even care. If, you, if I don't feel safe, in, let's say, in, within this environment, I don't care to share with you anything. I don't care to provide my feedback. I don't care to even uh, or, or bother to do anything. I just can just sit around, okay, and do nothing, get paid, and, and that's it. And many people actually do that. So what we need to do is not nurture. I'm not talking about nurturing, but at least making everybody feel at different stages because at the early stages of life, all you want to do is have your physiological needs there. Okay, you need to eat, you need to have your basics, okay, you need your energy, and then you need to feel safe, because unless you, you are, and as an individual, content with your internal energy, okay, you wouldn't think about anything, any other thing. So if you're hungry, you don't care if you're safe or not, you're hungry. But once you're satisfied, you want to think of other things, okay, and this is between you and your mental status, you would need to be, okay, and you would want to feel safe before you can move on to other things like being belonging to another community, having better self-esteem and ego, and to actually perceive yourself as a self-actualizer within your own community where you are actually contributing, and we can see that most of you are self-actualizing here, okay? And you are contributing from yourself and your own experiences, and you are actually uh, uh, showing that you have actual influence and you can influence change with, uh, within your communities.